Hey folks, how's everybody doing out there? Over the last few videos, we've looked at the history of text encoding, from Morse code to ASCII to Unicode, and we've talked about a whole bunch of quirks and edge cases from different languages and alphabets. But there's one thing we haven't talked about yet, and it is actually one of the most fundamental considerations for building any kind of system that is going to work with text encoding. ASCII was built around the assumption that we had 8 bits in a byte and we'd use one byte for each character. And code pages were a way of extending this approach to give us an extra 128 characters. Which is good enough for one language at a time, but that still only gave you 256 possible characters to work with. So when the Unicode project set out to assign a single unique code point to every letter and symbol used in all human languages and alphabets, it was immediately obvious they were going to assign a lot more than 256 code points, which means that the vast majority of characters aren't going to fit in a single byte. So in this video, the final installment in this uh, little series about text encodings, we're going to find out how multi-byte encodings actually work. And we're going to start back in 2016. I'm at work one morning and, you know, drinking coffee, trying to work out what kind of day it's going to be. And one of my team comes over to my desk and he says, uh, dude, I think you should take a look at this. I think we might have been hacked. Now, everyone who's worked in IT will have heard this a thousand times. I've been hacked. No, you haven't. You've left caps lock on. No, that's just a scam email. No, you've accidentally opened the Chrome console. But the guy I was talking to here is one of the best infosec people that I've ever worked with. So when he says we've been hacked, I stop what I'm doing and I say, you know, why do you think we've been hacked? There's Chinese in the Windows event log. And I remote into the box and I go into the event viewer and he's absolutely right. There is what appears to be Chinese in the event logs. Now, we're a British company based in London. None of us speaks Chinese. We don't do any business in China. So whatever this is, we have no idea where it's coming from. So one of the team starts digging through the database records in case this is some kind of SQL injection attack we got going on. Somebody else is looking through firewall logs, access records. I tell the rest of the company, hey, we're investigating potential security breach. Next update in 20 minutes. Let me know if you notice anything weird in the meantime. And having delegated all of the important stuff, I decide the best thing to do is to post about it on Twitter. Never underestimate the potential of social media to actually solve your problems. It's not reliable, but once in a while, because I got a reply back almost immediately saying the low bits are all null, so this is probably UTF-16LE being mistaken for UTF-16BE or vice versa. And I'm thinking, what? What is UTF-16? What does LE and BE mean? What? So I start looking stuff up. Uh, that, friends, that was the day that I learned about the wonderful world of Unicode character encoding. So Unicode turns strings into numbers. Every character gets a number. And when you try to map every character in every alphabet ever used by any human language, you get a lot of characters, certainly more than the 256 characters that fit into a single byte. So the vast majority of Unicode code points take more than one byte to store them. And this is where things get interesting, because there are a bunch of different systems that we use to work out which bytes belong to which character. So we're looking at the Windows event log, and uh, as I found out during a few frantic hours of research that morning, uh, most of the Microsoft Windows operating system, it stores strings internally using something called UTF-16. Every character is stored in memory using exactly two bytes, 16 bits, hence UTF-16. Now, if you take a nice common English database word, like delete, and you encode that as UTF-16, you get this. Because all the characters are just plain old vanilla ASCII, the first half of every byte pair is all zeros. It's what we call a zero byte or a null. And then the second half, that's the same as the good old ASCII codes. But wait a second, who decided that the big half of the number goes first? What if we decide we are going to encode each pair of bytes the other way round, and we'll put the ASCII in the first half and the null in the second half? These are both completely valid standard encodings. One of them is called Big Endian Encoding, the other is called Little Endian Encoding. And as we've seen time and time again, encodings only work if everybody is using the same one. 
If we take our nice sensible English word delete and we turn it into UTF-16 using little endian encoding and then decode it using big endian, we get, look at that, Chinese in the event logs. Now, if you're wondering what this means, I actually remember the day that this happened. Somebody ran it through Google Translate and they said that it might be like a really weird ransom note about like precious stones and dead chickens. Um, I found out a long while later, thanks to Nicholas Chan, who left a comment on one of my conference videos, that the characters here actually mean uh, to dismember the body of livestock, uh, to climb a category of textiles and fabrics, and uh, gems, pearls, or jade placed in the mouth of a corpse. So probably not a ransom note then. But next question, you know, how did a Windows event log on our CRM server end up with the wrong encoding? It didn't. What actually happened? Uh, one of the virtual network switches in a data center was failing and it was dropping bytes. Not many, just the odd byte here and there. But with UTF-16, when you are looking at a stream of bytes, there is no way to tell if one of them has gone missing. And so when one of our bytes went missing, everything just got shunted sideways by one byte and the Windows event log just kept on logging it. Now, what made this hilarious was that it was dropping one byte roughly every three minutes. So everything would go wrong, for three minutes nothing would work, and then suddenly it would all start working again. And everything's fine for a couple of minutes. It took us nearly 48 hours to figure out what was going on here. Um, eventually, we figured it out. We fired the vendor who assured us the whole time that it couldn't possibly be a problem with their system. Uh, we migrated everything to a different cloud provider. And along the way, we all learned a lot about UTF-16. Now, there's actually four different ways to turn Unicode text into a series of bytes. Uh, we've just seen UTF-16, where everything is exactly two bytes. UTF-16 is used internally by uh, Windows, Java, JavaScript. But the biggest drawback with UTF-16 is that for data that is mostly ASCII, it's incredibly inefficient. Now, when you're dealing with local storage, RAM, file systems, the relative predictability of having a fixed width encoding, that gives you lots of scope for performance optimizations. But then once you get out onto the internet, bandwidth becomes a consideration. Unicode has made the World Wide Web genuinely worldwide. You can write web pages in whatever language and alphabet you want to, and most of the time they work. But even if your website is in Ukrainian, all of your HTML tags are ASCII, your style sheets are ASCII, your JavaScript, please tell me your JavaScript is in ASCII. This is a simple web page. It's written in Ukrainian Cyrillic, and it just says, Privyet, hi. But uh, the only bits of this file that actually need more than one byte are these bits, the bits that are written for humans. The rest of it, plain 1960s flavored seven bit ASCII. If we encoded this web page as UTF-16, it takes up 210 bytes and 93 of those bytes are the ASCII null, zero, zero. We are losing 44% of our bandwidth to literally nothing. The other problem with UTF-16 is it still doesn't have enough code points. 16 bits gives us over 65,000 characters to play with. But once you factor in Unicode blocks for things like sheet music and chess notation and emoji, you quickly reach code points that are too big to fit in a 16-bit number. Now, one solution to this is something called a surrogate pair, which lets us store a single character as four bytes by using two adjacent UTF-16 characters. There's also UTF-32, which is like UTF-16, but every character is represented by four bytes. So sure, you can store all your sheet music and your chess games, but you're using four times more space than you need to. Four times more disk space, four times more network bandwidth, four times more memory. Yeah, not great. But UTF-16 and UTF-32, they have one other big problem. They're not compatible with ASCII. And there is a lot of ASCII out there on the internet. Decades worth of newsgroups, mailing lists, and source code. And the thing about ASCII documents is they don't have any kind of special header or code or anything to advertise the fact that they're ASCII files. You know, wh why would they? What else were they gonna be way back in 1965? Well, okay, they might have been EBSIDIC, but unless you work for IBM, nobody cares. But what if, what if there was an encoding where all those decades worth of ASCII documents, they still worked absolutely fine, but we could also encode all of our Russian and Korean and Greek documents and our chess games and our ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics all in the same file. Well, there is. 
It's called UTF-8, and it is probably the most brilliant hack in the history of computer science. Uh, it was designed by Rob Pike and Ken Thompson, apparently on a placemat in a diner in New Jersey in 1992, and here's how it works. First, any byte that starts with a zero is exactly the same as it was in the original ASCII specification. So all those old ASCII text and source code files, they're all valid UTF-8 without changing a single bit. But if any byte starts with a one, that indicates it is part of a multi-byte sequence. If a multi-byte sequence starts with 110, two-byte sequence. 1110 is a three-byte sequence, and so on. And if the byte you're looking at starts with a 10, you're in the middle of a sequence, so you got to back it up a couple of bytes until you find the beginning, and then work forwards from there. Now, the algorithm, I guess, is good for anything up to eight-byte sequences. You know, in theory, you could have a block of eight ones followed by eight continuation blocks, but UTF-8 is deliberately limited to four-byte sequences so that you can transcode it to UTF-32 if you have to. Now, UTF-8 is not perfect. Its biggest flaw is uh, because a single letter could be encoded as one, two, three, or four bytes, you can't tell how many characters are in a string by counting the bytes. And if you want to iterate across a string one character at a time, uh, you can't just use a loop. You've got to inspect the bytes to work out where the actual characters are. Um, it also has the slightly odd quality that any valid sequence of bytes is considered a valid string. So you can have a string which is just a combining character without specifying what you're going to combine it with. And because any non-ASCII characters are going to take a couple of bytes each as uh, byte markers, there are some characters that require three bytes in UTF-8 that would only require two bytes in UTF-16. Oh, uh, if you're wondering what the fourth encoding system is, we've seen UTF-8, UTF-16, UTF-32. If you poke around this stuff long enough, you'll eventually stumble across the cursed encoding. UTF-7. Uh, SMTP, Internet Email, still uses 7-bit ASCII for email headers and a handful of other things. So if you need to put anything in your email headers which isn't 7-bit ASCII, UTF-7 gives you a way to encode it. But in 25 years of building applications that build and format and send email, I have never yet had to deal with UTF-7, and you know, I am okay with that. But UTF-8, on the other hand, UTF-8 is everywhere, and the handful of systems and platforms that don't support it, you can bet they are working on it. It's a beautiful, it's an elegant solution, and every year when the Unicode Consortium rolls out their latest batch of must-have emojis, take a moment to appreciate that Unicode and UTF-8 is what makes it all possible. Folks, that about wraps it up for our history of text encoding systems. But I want to leave you with one more story. My fascination with alphabets and encodings started in 2016, when uh, I was fortunate enough, I was invited to speak at the Build Stuff conference in Kiev in uh, Ukraine. Uh, it was my first time visiting any country that didn't use the Latin alphabet. So I'm walking around, you know, wide-eyed and basically illiterate. I can't read the road signs. I can't read the restaurant menus. I can't read any of the advertisements on the billboards and things. But I could read the license plates on the cars. And I asked one of the folks who was hosting us, I said, you know, hey, why, why, do the, why do the cars in Ukraine have English number plates? And they looked at me confused. They're like, what? Ukrainian cars don't have English number plates. So we did a little digging. 1965, the same year as 7-bit ASCII, there was a thing called the Vienna Convention on Road Traffic. Big international treaty about what to do if people in Europe wanted to drive their cars across borders into other countries. And one of the stipulations of the treaty was that license plates should only use the Latin alphabet. Now, one of the signatories of the Vienna Convention was the Soviet Union, despite the fact that Soviet license plates in 1965 did not use the Latin alphabet. Um, I've heard from a couple of people that uh, if you could get the necessary you know, permits and paperwork to be allowed to drive outside the USSR, you would be issued with temporary license plates at the border. And I'm guessing they had all kinds of ways to make sure that you brought them back. But then in the 1990s, the Soviet Union broke up. And most of the countries which had formerly been part of the USSR, they overhauled their vehicle registration systems. And the solution they came up with was particularly ingenious. 
it's uh, slightly different for each country because they use slightly different versions of the Cyrillic alphabet. But in Ukraine, they took the set of glyphs. They're not letters. These aren't the same sound. They're the same shape. They took the set of glyphs that occur in both the Latin and the Ukrainian Cyrillic alphabet. And that is the set of glyphs that are used on Ukrainian license plates. And if you rearrange those letters in English, it spells the phrase Pike Matchbox. So folks, next time somebody says that they're sending you a plain text file, ask them if they know about Pike Matchbox. Because if they do, it means they've seen these videos and they know all about code pages and Big Endian and Little Endian, UTF-8 and the Turkish dotless I and Kohuept and all the other wonderful ways that we've come up with to get written words in and back out of the computer. And if they say no, what's Pike Matchbox? Well, they're going to send you a file that works on their machine. And what happens when you try to open it? Well, that's a story for another time. Folks, thank you so much for joining me on this uh, little journey through the history of text encodings. Uh, I'll be back next week, but in the meantime, you have an excellent week out there. You take it easy, look after each other, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.